Welcome to night two of the Urban League of Louisiana's candidate forum for Orleans Parish School Board. Um, welcome, and I would like to introduce our president and CEO, Judy Reese Morris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to night two of the Urban League of Louisiana's Orleans Parish School Board candidate forum on educational equity. We are so excited to bring candidates from districts three, four, and five to you this evening so you can get to know them a little bit more, but more importantly, get to hear how they feel about racial equity. The Urban League of Louisiana recently issued a report, Advancing Educational Equity in New Orleans Public Schools. I highly recommend it to you. You can see it on our website, which is urbanleaguela.org. This report speaks to a number of disparities that exist in our public school system, but it also offers recommendations about what can be done in order to address those disparities and to close the gap for our young people. You'll hear from candidates tonight who will be answering questions based on the report. We ask each of them to read the report and be prepared to answer questions about what they would do if they are elected to the Orleans Parish School Board, because we understand how important the Orleans Parish School Board is to addressing this issue of racial equity within our public school system. So I'm excited to hear what they have to say and get their responses to this important report. Again, you can see this report on our website, urbanleaguela.org. I'm also really happy to tell you that this candidate forum is a part of the Urban League of Louisiana's Wake Up, Go Vote voter initiative. This initiative gets activated every time that there is an election. We know how important it is for people to be educated and prepared and also to actually get out and vote. And so we'll be doing a lot this month that we hope you'll be joining us for so that you can understand what the issues are and then exercise your right to vote. Activate your voice and activate your vote. We've got an important candidate forum happening on October 15th, where you'll have an opportunity to hear about a number of the issues and statewide amendments that will be on the ballot. We know who's running for president, but there are also a number of other important races on the ballot. So we're calling it our Down Ballot Initiative Forum. And we want you to tune in on October 15th and learn about all of those important amendments and those important issues. So that again, you're informed and you're prepared and you're ready to go and vote on November the 3rd. So with that, I think it's time for us to get started. Uh, we've got an exciting, exciting evening for you. Uh, we're going to end on time because we know that there is an important debate happening tonight, so we want to make sure that we finish so that everybody has an opportunity to watch that debate so that we are as well informed as possible and, again, prepared to act on November 3rd. Our moderator this evening is LeBron Joseph. He is a host. He's a journalist. Uh, he's an activist. We are so honored to have him with us as our moderator. He is going to uh, engage our candidates from District 3, 4, and 5. And Mr. Joseph, I am so glad that you're here with us tonight. Thank you for being with us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Judy. It's good to be here. Uh, what an incredible night. Uh, you mentioned that debate, the debate happening a little later. Uh, and we've got a bit of a debate here tonight as well, at least a forum where we can share some ideas and find out exactly how the candidates for the Orleans Parish School Board feel about some of the most pressing issues as it relates to quality. Judy, you mentioned the forum, uh, the, the report, I should say, the Urban League report, the Urban League of, uh, of Louisiana. And, and this is a report that, that you've redone, if you will. The Urban League did this report for the first time back in 2017, identified some issues here in the city that need to be taken care of, and revisited uh, many of those issues this time around. Uh, notably finding the academic achievement gaps and the chronically low performing schools, uh, limited supply of high demand schools for our students, uh, increased costs associated with decentralization and the attraction and retention of a diverse high quality teaching force. All those things are spelled out in the report that Judy mentioned. 
Uh, we'd like to welcome tonight our candidates. Uh, I will name you guys and then we'll go down the line and give you an opportunity for at least an opening statement. Joining us is Mr. Philip C. Phil Brickman, running for District 3. Uh, Mr. Olin Parker, also running for District 3. Thanks so much for joining us. Winston Boone Whitten Jr. from District 4. Uh, Catherine Bodwin uh, from District 5. Rosella Jackson from District 5. And also Antoinette Williams from District 5. Tonight, we will first take the District 3 and 4 together. And what we'd like to do is start off by offering you guys an opportunity of two minutes each for an opening statement on racial equality and your initial reaction to the findings in the report. And we'll start with Philip C. Phil Brickman first. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Phil Brickman. I'm a lifelong New Orleanian. I've lived in District 3 for 15 years now. I'm running for the school board District 3 as a concerned charter school parent and also to make a, a positive contribution to our city's future. I think we all would agree that the solutions to many of our city's problems start uh, and challenges uh, begin with a successful education system and our children deserve nothing less. But there's a lot of work to do despite some of the improvements that have been made. I wanna thank the Urban League of Louisiana for their uh, invitation and for their comprehensive report on educational equity, which provided me personally with a lot of insight on the issues facing our school system. I certainly will use that and guide that in my decision-making when I'm elected. Certainly ed uh, equity in education and racial equity is important, especially for our school district. And I would, um, I will direct my efforts on the school board to do my best to uphold those principles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Brinkman. Olin Parker. Uh, so, Thank you for having me tonight. I just want to start by saying that I truly appreciate the work that the Urban League does and the Urban League's commitment to improving the lives of people in our city. I am lucky enough to live just down the street from your headquarters, so I am kind of uniquely familiar with all of uh, the programming that you bring to the city, whether it is your voter registration drives or your uh, drive to get people to fill out the census or just handing out masks on Carrollton Street. Um, and certainly this report is a big part of the work that you do, and I'm very appreciative of that as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to discussing the findings of that report tonight, um, but frankly, because I've spent my entire career in education trying to build a more equitable school system, the report findings weren't surprising to me, uh, but they were and are extremely relevant uh, and are the very reason, in fact, why I chose to run for school board in the first place. A little bit about me, I am a former teacher, a public school parent and an education administrator. Uh, my brothers, parents, and grandparents are all teachers, and I have three main priorities in this race. The first is opportunity for every child, and what I mean by that is expanded access to mental health services, trauma-informed discipline services at our school, and comprehensive career and technical education. My second priority is making sure that we have an A-rated school in every neighborhood. I think parents should have the opportunity to send their kids to a great school down the street if that's what they desire. And my third priority that I talk about everywhere I go is a comprehensive racial equity plan for the district. And that includes things like equitable funding for our schools, a comprehensive disadvantaged business enterprise program, and equity training for all NOLA Public Schools staff and Orleans Parish School Board members. I spent my entire career dedicated to improving education outcomes for children, especially children that are victims of poverty. Uh, and I believe that these priorities are the right next steps for our city. So thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to discussing the report more in detail. All right, thanks so much, Mr. Parker. Mr. Winston Boom Whitten Jr., I'd love to hear from you. Good evening. I would like to thank the Urban League of Louisiana for having me and allowing me the opportunity to express my platform. I am a native New Orleans. I was born and raised in the community of Algiers, the district in which I seek to hold the office of Orleans Parish School Board number four. I was educated within district number four, all 
education as it relates to elementary school, junior high, and high school. I attained a degree in biology from Southern University, and since then I have led a career in education. I have been a substitute teacher, a paraprofessional, and an educator teacher of sciences. I moved on to become an advisor for educational talent search program by the way of TRIO, Dilla University, and also an assistant director of the Upper Bound program for the greater, um, for the Salvation Army of Greater Houston. I have experience in policy. I have experience in classroom as it relates to education. My platform, I plan to advocate for equity, transparency, and accountability within the schools. I want to serve as a liaison on the behalf of students, parents, and teachers. I want to implement policies that have been developed with empathy in mind, and I push to eliminate the one app which currently exists within all these private schools, and I will also push to reestablish community schools which we currently do not have in all these parish as it relates to the findings in the report they were not shocking these are this is that is information that i as an educator and all educators within new orleans are aware of and understand that that's why it's a need for massive education reform with the voice of the community in which the schools are to service with the voice of the students, the parents, and the teachers that also serve to serve the service to serve the students within all these parish. So I understand the findings, and I do have plans that I would like to implement and propose once elected to the seat of all these parish school board district number four. Thank you. All right, Mr. Whitten, thank you so much. Guys, it's the three of you um, in round one, and essentially you'll be asked two of the questions in round one, you'll have a chance to respond to two of the questions. Uh, four topics, one being eighth grade math, the second one being school discipline, the third question will surround teacher quality, and the fourth question will surround selective admissions. I will choose randomly from those questions, but you will have an opportunity to answer two of the questions. And we'll start with Mr. Brickman asking you uh, about teacher quality. And the data shows that when it comes to the distribution of teachers rated highly effective, economically disadvantaged students and African-American students do not have equitable access. The question is from one of the fellows of the Urban League's Policy Fellowship for Young Adults, Riley Smith, who currently attends Southern University. She's an education major, currently student teaching and she's getting closer to having the responsibility of managing a classroom. It's important to her that she would have the access to continued support. And so Riley's question is, what is your opinion about teacher certifications and their effectiveness in preparing teachers for being in the classroom? Thank you. I, I think that there should be minimal professional standards uh, for teachers through certification. I think we have that in other professions like mine, the legal profession. It keeps us on our toes. It keeps us current. And uh, I think that the school board with its uh, with the school system with a $647 million budget has the resources to provide continuing education and training for the teachers after they begin their career. I think that uh, all teachers across this school district should be supported. And that's something that the school board should do and encourage for the betterment of all the schools. Uh, in addition to that, I think that the school board could reach out and work with local universities and other educational associations that I believe have existing programs to again, make sure the teachers are current and, uh, and honing their skills and giving the kids the best education that they can have. Thank you so much. Olin Parker. Let's talk about selective admissions. In the 2019 school year, some schools had eligibility requirements such as emerging language programs that require set levels of language proficiency, others that require parents or guardians to attend a curriculum meeting, open house, or the tour. The four public schools that do not participate in the one app application process accept applications and make school assignments decisions at the school level. In other words, it's not system-wide. 
The report looked at demographics by admissions type and found that economically disadvantaged students and African-American students are underrepresented in schools with selective admissions and restrictive eligibility policies. What are your views on selective admissions policies? And would you support any changes to admissions policies if you're elected? So I thank you for the question. Uh, I think the first and the easiest thing that the school board can do is eliminate barriers within existing selective uh, admission schools admissions processes. I know that there are schools that are not in the one app process right now that have rules around what is required to apply and when applications can be turned in that penalize working families and, and penalize students that are victims of poverty. Um, any part of a school's application process that restricts access to the application itself should stop immediately. Um, more broadly, I'm not opposed to selective admission schools. I think they can and do play a productive role in school systems, both in New Orleans and around the country. I would imagine many of the people watching tonight are graduate, graduates of selective admission schools. And we've had them in our city for decades. And I think some of our brightest minds and most talented artists and musicians come from them. What I am opposed to are selective admission schools that are inequitable. So I think they should be, uh, I think all selective admission schools should be required to provide transportation to all of their students. I think that all schools should participate in one app when their current contracts are up. And I think if a selective admission school is not meeting its required economically disadvantaged percentage, or if it's underserving black and brown students, those schools should be required to advertise their events and their application processes in a way that is targeted to increase the enrollment of underrepresented groups. This is an issue that's particularly important to me given my work previously at the Department of Education, uh, where I made sure that type two charters were more equitable. I know from experience that policy can shift enrollment outcomes in a positive direction. And I think that our city and our schools will be better for it. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Parker. Uh, Mr. Witten, with regards to eighth grade math, the concepts taught during eighth grade provide the foundation for understanding future math concepts. Math prepares and develops the ability to accept, analyze, and execute complex ideas, and math performance has found to be a predictor of post-secondary success. In 2019, the NOLA Public Schools reported 23% of eighth graders scored mastery or above on the LEAP 2025 math assessment, which is below the state average of 28%. Additionally, schools where most students scored higher in eighth grade math have fewer students who are economically disadvantaged and more of the student population is white. So what would you wanna see implemented to support schools in ensuring all students are reaching this critical milestone of eighth grade math? Well, what I would propose is that we implement a system to whereas every school is following the same curriculum. As it stands, individual ch charter school networks have the ability to choose and select which curriculum students use. If we had an umbrella governance of all these private schools to whereas that governance had control over said curriculum, then we can ensure that the curriculum that each school is teaching are up to the standards that can keep up with every student on a national level. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have identified curriculums that work and curriculums that feed into how kids will be actually tested on any standardized test, be it a state standardized, standardized test or the ACT or the SAT. So if we had a system to where everyone had a curriculum that actually prepared kids to do well in mathematics, then we can alleviate that problem. However, we have independent charter networks picking and choosing curriculums, and those curriculums have not been has not been tested to see if they are actually adequate enough to um, fill um, to fill and close the achievement gap with students that participate in um, mathematics. So we have to understand that we have to create and develop curriculums that target those students where they are and build them up to a national level so that they can compete on the national level with every other student within this, not only the city and the state, but the country. Thank you, Mr. Whitten. Uh, Mr. Brickman, back to you. Uh, as it relates to school discipline, student discipline rates, meaning in school and out school suspensions and expulsions are lower in New Orleans than the rest of the state, but 
when we look at disciplinary actions by subgroups, we find that economically disadvantaged students and African American students are overrepresented. How would you support schools and how should they address racial disparities in disciplinary action? Yes, well, I think that um, discipline should be handled in a thoughtful way that is respectful of a child's circumstances and needs. And we can also look at best practices when, uh, when considering trauma a trauma-informed approach when handling disciplinary matters where appropriate. I also support the, the, uh, the current school board's central hearing office so that all disciplinary matters are handled in on a uniform basis throughout the district. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mr. Parker, earlier we asked Mr. Brickman about teacher quality and that question from Riley Smith, right, from up at Southern. He also had another question I'd like for you to answer. And uh, she'd like to know, what would you do to invest in the professional development of teachers as a school board member? So uh, first, first off, I'd like to thank Riley for the question and especially for entering the field of education. I think there's nothing more rewarding than being a teacher. And, and so I am truly grateful for her and all her classmates uh, in, in joining this fight. Uh, regarding teacher professional development, I think the first thing that we need to do is ensure that we're attracting the best young people into the profession. You know, we need to build on existing partnerships, with colleges and universities, especially historically black colleges and universities to train and hire college graduates that will return to their community and teach uh, throughout their lives. I think, you know, we know that data shows that students perform better when they have a teacher or teachers that look like them. And I think OPSB should continue and expand partnerships like the Norman Francis Teacher Residency uh, to ensure that schools in this city have a strong and recurring pipeline of black and brown talent. Uh, and that those new teachers receive comprehensive and ongoing support, not just in their first year, but well into their teaching careers. I think finally, uh, you know, one of the ways to become a great teacher is to remain in the classroom for a long time. And so I think we need to explore all avenues to ensure that our teachers are well compensated and that they are rewarded for remaining in the classroom for a long time. I don't think that teachers should have to move into AP or principal roles simply so that they can afford to live or afford to buy a house. Um, so just to kind of summarize, I think the first thing we need to do is attract high quality talent like Riley and like other people in her program. The second thing we need to do is nurture that talent uh, through ongoing high quality professional development that is aligned to the curriculum that they're receiving. And finally, we need to adequately compensate that talent so that they remain in the classroom and remain impacting lives uh, in the district for decades. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, Mr. Witten, we're gonna circle back to the issue of selective admissions and ask you about that. That report looked at demographics by admissions type. Of course, it found that economically disadvantaged students and African-American students are represent, underrepresented in the schools with selective admissions and restrictive eligibility policies. I think you touched on a bit of that earlier, but what are your views on selective admissions policies? Would you support any changes to the admission policies if you're elected? Um, I'm totally against the one app. What I, what I want to fight for is community schools, and that will give every child within the district in which they reside the opportunity to attend a school within that district. Now to the selective admission. We have eight schools that have a selective admission policy. There are 4,766 white kids in all these private schools. There are 38,881 black kids in all these private schools. 65% of white students attend selective, selective schools, while 7% of the black kids attend selective schools. What we should do is eliminate the one app and again, allow our students to attend schools within their districts. Recreate community schools. That will service the needs of the community. Of those 38,881 black students, the mass majority of them live in socially economic disadvantaged communities. So we have to keep in mind that these families are struggling. With the one app, 
It allows for students to be shipped across town. I may live in Algiers and have to attend school in New Orleans East. That's going to put a strain on the system, not only because the mass amounts of money we are spending on busing, but it actually disenfranchises and disengages parents from being able to be active participants in their child's education. Of those disenfranchised families, many of those families do not, do not have adequate transportation. So it's to be an active participant in your child's education, you have to travel to those respective schools. If the child attends a school across town and the mother, or father, and family doesn't have adequate transportation, it's going to make it hard to be an active participant in their um, education. Also, we have to look at the fact that we have a one app in the selective process and students are arbitrarily just sent to whatever school that's available. We have students that are catching the bus at the wee hours of the morning and are arriving back home late in the evening. We have kids um, as young as six, seven, and eight years old catching the buses. So we have to understand that the selective process has disenfranchised not only the black student, but the community as a whole. If we return to community schools, we can galvanize the community and better service our students in all these parish. Well, congratulations, gentlemen. You made it through round one. Appreciate it. <laughs> in round two, each candidate will have a chance to respond to both of the questions in round two. I will ask them one question at a time. We'll go through the three of you guys and then we'll ask the second question, okay? So the very first question, we will start with uh, Mr. Parker. We've asked you to respond to the data on important indicators related to racial equality or racial equity in education, but what is the most important to you that you would prioritize if you were elected? Sure, so I talked about it already tonight. I'm gonna to talk about it at length now. Um, I bring up the need for a comprehensive and sustained racial equity plan at every door that I knock on. It doesn't matter who answers the door or what neighborhood I'm in, I bring it up always. It is deeply important to me. Uh, my wife and I talk with our kids about our five family core values all the time. Justice, purpose, integrity, kindness and joy and i wouldn't be living those values if i didn't make a strong racial equity plan the centerpiece of both my candidacy and my service on the board and i've touched on it already but when i talk about a strong racial equity plan i mean a plan that provides equitable funding for all of our schools i think schools that serve significant percentages of students in poverty could have the resources to address that that challenge i think there should be a strong disadvantaged business enterprise program one that actually goes to businesses that are owned by black and brown entrepreneurs, not shell companies that are primarily comprised of white business owners and white employees. Uh, I think there should be equity training for all OPSB members, NOLA public school staff and charter school staff. And I think that we need to work to increase the diversity of our charter school boards as well, because that will impact everything from school discipline, like we talked about earlier tonight, uh, to who gets hired as a network CEO or as a school administrator. I think that uh, you know whatever racial equity plan is developed needs to have ambitious goals, a superintendent that can lead the district towards those goals, and needs to be constantly monitored to ensure its success. Now, I'm not interested in a plan that kind of checks the box and moves on. Uh, this is not, racial equity work is not work that will be completed in the next four years. At least the school board should consider it completed. Uh, I'm advocating for a racial equity plan that will lead us to enduring systemic change uh, that benefits students enrolled in all of our schools. Got it. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Witten and then come back to you, Mr. Brickman. You'll answer the first one on the last end, but Mr. Brick, Mr. Witten, I should say, uh, as it relates to racial equity in education, what issue is most important to you and what would you prioritize if you were elected? I believe that each student deserves an equitable and fair education within all these parish school board. One of the main issues that I want to address is the ability for charter school networks to operate with um, almost autonomy and with no oversight from the superintendent, which is supposed to govern the system. So I will propose that a total blanket governance of all schools within all these parish school board so we can ensure that the schools are operating and function financially responsibly and also serving the kids academic needs by implementing programs and policies and procedures that are in place that are across the spectrum so we're not going to have networks struggling to figure out um, 
um, resolve for this issue, and it's going to be different from the resolve that another charter school network um, has formulated to resolve that issue. So I think cohesiveness amongst the school needs to be established so that policies, practices, and procedures are clear. And then when those policies and procedures are clear, they're across the board, such as discipline policies, such as as it relates to what curriculum that we're going to follow as it relates to mathematics, science, English, reading, or whatever discipline that the child um, or students will take at that particular grade level. So my main concern is establishing a centralized system of governance that can oversee the fiscal responsive, uh, oversee the various schools fiscally and also academically to ensure that funds are being appropriate, appropriated in the proper places to better service our kids. Um, what charter school networks um, have done is they have not actually chosen the proper channels in which to service our kids because we have people that are in control of our school that doesn't that don't understand the community in which they serve. So once you begin to implement policies with empathy and with the thought in the forefront of your mind of the people that you're servicing, you can actually implement programs that are better service those students. All right, thank you, Mr. Whitten and Mr. Brickman. Uh, same question as it relates to racial equity in education. What's the issue that's most important to you and what would you prioritize if you were elected? Yeah, I think the number one priority for all of us should be expanding access to high quality schools. I think I think that's the bottom line. Every parent wants to send their child to the best school that they can. And I think the, uh, the school board and the, the Department of Education so far haven't done enough in our city. We've got a handful of A and B schools. Uh, we've, got, we've made some improvements, but we don't have enough. We're all clamoring on the one app uh, and hope that we get in the lottery and get in one of these few schools. So we need more schools across the city so parents don't have to bus their children across town. They've got A and B schools in their neighborhood all over. I think we've got the budget. We've got to spend, make, uh, rank our priorities and spend wisely so it goes to the benefit of the children. And we need to encourage the growth of successful schools by reaching out to the successful charter operators, getting them to expand their campuses, open new campuses, grow their own campuses, so we've got better opportunities. That's going on right now with the Heinz Charter. We'll see how that works out. But I think if you go to successful operators, uh, hopefully they, they know what they're doing and they can open better campuses throughout the city. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you. And, and question two, that if all three of you will get an opportunity to answer this, but we'll start again with Mr. Brickman in reviewing the Urban League's recommendations. Are there any that you strongly agree with and how would you actively support them? Yeah, well, there's two. Uh, there's two. One on the issue of transparency and increased transparency. Certainly uh, in the Department of Education, you know, they've got their, their grading system. All the parents have to have all the data so they can make choices when they, when they rank the one up and they just try to get in the schools that they want for their children. If uh, their charter, the school that they're going to is pulled or, or taken away for various reasons, they need to know why. And it all has to be laid out clearly so they can make the right choices for their children. And uh, I'm definitely going to support transparency and make sure that all parents across the city know how their schools are doing, how they're ranked, and also how their money is being spent. It's a massive budget and everybody deserves to know how much money is out there and what's out there for their children and why things aren't being done uh, properly for the money that they're getting. And secondly, um, I think bold leadership, the final point in the report, we all need to be ambassadors. We need to be proud of the improvements uh, that are made. We need to go out there to the rest of the country and say, look, you know, our school system has made some improvements. We're working hard to do it, to do better and encourage people to come to the city and be proud of the city, which will help economic growth and raise up people uh, in tough circumstances. So I definitely agree that all the school board members need to be ambassadors and portray the city in a positive light and let everybody know that we're doing the right thing here for our kids in the public school system. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Parker. And reviewing the recommendations from the Urban League, are there any that you strongly agree with and how would you actively support them? 
So I really appreciate the Urban League's recommendations, and frankly, I agree with all of them. Uh, in fact, pretty much all of them are represented in the top three priorities that I have for my campaign that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this forum. Uh, when I talk about an A-rated school in every neighborhood, I'm talking about expanding high-quality options for families. But everybody wants that. It's kind of a no-brainer. So I'll go more in-depth into one of the other recommendations in the report. Um, on page 55, I talked about holding the superintendent and NOLA Public Schools staff accountable for reducing the existing achievement and opportunity gap. And frankly, I think that the superintendent's performance review needs to be tied explicitly to reducing achievement and opportunity gaps. Uh, am I interested in raising the district performance score? Absolutely. But if we're only increasing academic outcomes for middle and upper income students, then we're failing our kids and we're failing our city. Uh, so regarding opportunity gaps, you know, I'm going to continue to advocate for what I call extracurricular excellence. New Orleans is what it is because of our commitment to art and music and all of the things that make life worth living. Our schools need to recognize that and embrace who we are in the activities that they offer to students. I use my own family as an example. My wife is a principal at a KIPP school off the of St. Bernard, uh, and all of my kids either go there or graduated from there. Last year, my oldest daughter was able to participate in band, where she learned four instruments, a robotics club, a quiz bowl, and a girls empowerment club. She helped form her identity because of the opportunities that were available to her at school. Uh, but those opportunities aren't available to everybody, either because their schools don't offer them or because their schools don't offer transportation, which I believe should be required. Um, I think reducing academic and opportunity gaps, like the report says, needs to be the guiding focus for the superintendent and NOLA Public School staff and for the Orleans Parish School Board. And I think the superintendent and NOLA Public School staff should be held accountable for their leadership in those areas. Thank you so much. And Mr. Whitten, uh, will you, uh, in reviewing the recommendations, are there any that you strongly agree with and how would you actively support them? Most all I strongly agree with. And my platform actually reflects a lot of those stances that the Urban League um, took and it sheds lights on a lot of the issues that they have to share light. I believe that we should have transparency within schools, not just transparency and fiscal, um, um, the fiscal responsibility of the school, but in transparency in what type of curriculums that we're offering our kids, what type of services are we offering our kids, what discipline looks like at those individual charter school networks. There needs to be transparency across the board so parents and students are aware of different policies that are being implemented towards them. There needs to be um, accountability as well, accountability for being account accounted for providing adequate services for our kids. Also ensuring that the proposals to educate our kids have the community in mind. Also educational equity. Every kid des deserves a fair and equal shot at, at um, receiving a fair education. We also have to look at leadership and also the abolishment of Act 91. Act 91 um, made way and gave more power to the charter school networks than it did to the um, Orleans Parish School Board and the superintendent. There's a huge issue with that because, again, charter schools are operating autonomously. Also, as it relates to school charter school networks receiving funds, they're receiving public funds. However, they're making private decisions. That's a conflict right there. We cannot make private decisions on public funds that are allocated towards, towards our students. So those are some of the things that I would like to address and we also need to develop more options for our kids. Mr. Parker spoke of extracurricular activities. Um, I totally agree with that, but along with those, we actually need student development programs that will aid and assist in our children being successful in post-secondary institutions. These um, charter schools, they label themselves as college preparatory, but as we see, our children are graduating from those high schools, but entering into a college university, but they're not being retained. If we implement programs embedded within all these private schools that aid and assist students in their academic development, not just 
in a subject matter, but also socially and understanding the responsibilities of being a college student and all that entails and developing those skills that aid and assist us in developing academically, then I believe our children and our students can be more successful. We need to look at those programs that just not being outside programs that are sponsored from the federal government, such as TRIO programs, but programs that are actually embedded and developed within all these private schools that service our children and that are present in the um, in the schools every day so our kids have access to those op opportunities and those options as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitten. Uh, we're at portion three of the uh, of the program here tonight, and that is about commitments, the answers being yes or no to the next two questions, and I'll ask you each for your yes or no response. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Brickman. Will you commit to using the Urban League report regularly and to look at data that is disaggregated by the subgroups to inform your decisions if you are elected? Yes, um, well, I, I said in the outset, it was a very insightful report and I appreciate it. And my answer is yes. Mr. Parker. Uh, yes, unequivocally, yes. And Mr. Witten. Absolutely, yes. Question number two. Will you commit to prioritizing and practicing racial equity throughout your term as a school board member if you are elected? We'll start with Mr. Witten. Absolutely, yes. Mr. Brickman. I will, yes. And Mr. Parker. Uh, yes, it's been a centerpiece of my campaign and will continue to be a centerpiece of my time on the board. Okay, if the Urban League folks don't shoot me on this one because we're running a little early because we did, uh, we were missing one uh, candidate from District 4. But what I would like to do is circle back for just a second. Before I give you guys time for your closing comments, I'd like to circle back to how we started tonight. And those four areas we discussed. And if you didn't get a chance, because the way this was set up, the way we did this is that we had an opportunity to respond to two of the questions, correct? But if there was one of the topics that you'd like to address, I'd like for you to address it. We will start with Mr. Parker, and that would be either eighth grade math, school discipline, teacher quality, or selective admissions. If you pick one of those and respond to it, and that's how we'll do the, the other two guys as well. And then we'll go to our, our, our closing comments. Everybody understand? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so I, uh, I really appreciate that opportunity. I'm glad that I get uh, it's hard for me to choose, um, but especially as a former math teacher myself, but I will, I'll address the um, question about racial disparities in discipline. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that there has been improvement that's been made on school discipline. Uh, I think we're a long way from where we were 10 years ago when it seemed like every option in the city was a no excuses charter school model, uh, but we're still not anywhere close to where we need to be. Um, as a district, we need to address structural and systemic factors that lead to black and brown students being suspended and expelled at disproportionate rates. My first priority that I talk about, Opportunity for Every Child, addresses this head on. Uh, when I say that, I mean expanding access to mental health services for our students, promoting trauma-informed discipline practices over no excuses models, expanding the concept of things like the Citywide Exceptional Needs Fund, so that the district is supporting the development, improvement, and expansion of behavioral support, behavioral health support, um, and also building on promising initiatives that exist currently, like the Center for Resilience uh, and the Bridge, which help those students that previously have been the hardest to serve. And I think there are a number of things, not a number of actions that the board can take related to the issue of school discipline. So I think the board can incorporate discipline policies as a central component of the charter school application process, and it shouldn't approve a charter unless that charter has a comprehensive and equitable plan for school discipline. I think the board can foster collaboration between charter school networks to share best practices around student support. I think there are pockets of really innovative work happening in the city right now, uh, and the board should play a role in making sure those are shared more broadly. Uh, I think the board should also be sharing discipline data with charter school board chairs so that those board chairs understand how their schools compare with state and local averages. And I think uh, the board can advocate with uh, advocate for students with city and state officials and city and state agencies to prioritize the needs of schools and young people 
that maybe fall outside of the traditional school day. So I think school discipline is trending in the right direction. Obviously, there still are a lot of disparities that need to be addressed, and I'm fighting to address those throughout my campaign. Uh, but I think the board needs to celebrate that success and then accelerate progress to eliminate the disparities that we see. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Okay, Mr. Brickman, eighth grade math or school discipline or teacher quality or selective admissions, were there any of those that you didn't get a chance to answer on, but you'd like to be able to comment on? Sure, let me, um, it's like uh, Hollywood Squares. Let me, let me go with four. <laughs> We go with uh, selective admissions um, for 300. No, uh, um, selective admissions, I think that there is a role for that. I think when it's evenly applied, like Ben Franklin High School, it's my understanding that, you know, they've got top top uh, requirements, but they don't turn anybody away, right? So if you pass, you you meet their requirements, you're going to get in and, and and do your best. And so I think that, you know, those things need to be evenly applied. Um of course, you know, we also need better schools, and to do that, I'm going to encourage the expansion of that with uh, asking successful charters to uh, to expand their operations and hopefully give the parents more uh, more options. So we're all, again, not trying to get into these one or two selected schools. Uh, and my daughter tried to get into uh, Lusher, and we didn't make the cut. And You know, we were bummed out, but uh, I guess, unfortunately, that's our system right now. But uh, those schools that are we allow to be selective, let's remember that they are receiving our taxpayer dollars. We're funding them. Uh, their administrators may be making very high salaries. So they need to be held accountable and to provide the services that they promise to all the students, whether it's special needs, underprivileged. So it needs to be done equitably as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Witten. Of those four things that uh, maybe you didn't get a chance to touch on, either selective admissions or teacher quality or, or school discipline or eighth grade math, which of those would you like to uh, speak on? When I speak of servicing students with empathy, that's keeping in mind that we need to develop a universal discipline policy which service students with empathy and ensure that students are not facing punitive consequences for many things. I had the opportunity to work in culture and development at a school here in Orleans Parish, and I did not agree with a lot of the practices that was being implemented towards our kids. It was very small things in which kids were actually academically punished for. So instead of being allowed to attend class for um, minor infractions, they were subjugated to have to spend the entire day in ISS. So we have to look at the entire disciplinary system and develop one umbrella system. And if we had one governance, then this one system would be applied to all schools to ensure that our students aren't facing harsh punitive consequences or punishments for something minor, but also addressing anything that may be major. But when we talk about discipline, you see throughout not just New Orleans in the city and the state, but the country, that we have a certain demographic of, of people that are harshly disciplined for just being themselves and um, being culturally aware of who they are, such as hairstyles, such as clothes, such as, um, preferences that they have, well, such as things that they have no control over. So we have to realize that we also have students that come from a socially economic disadvantaged background. So when it comes down to uniform policies, instead of being real strict and lenient on and strong and stern on uniform policies, we need to understand that, okay, that child may be out of uniform because the circumstances beyond his control. So instead of punishing that child for not being in the proper uniform, let's give him the assistance in that family assistance that they need to ensure that that child actually comes to school um, proper. So we have to look at it from a perspective of the people that we service and ensure that our students aren't being over-policed, over-policed on things such as attitudes, especially in the middle school um, level to where as students are of, of adolescent age and they're developing and they're not actually understanding the changes that they are going through and they may express themselves um, through a negative disposition attitude instead of chastising that 
attitude the child has, that should be an actual teachable moment. So instead of having that child suffer some type of consequence for maybe responding to you wrong or having a wrong disposition, we need to um, teach that child how to better present themselves in the public towards their peers, towards their teachers, towards their administrators, or towards anybody within that school. I think that we jump too fast to just um, um, hand out a punishment and not service the child and understand the needs of that child. That child, those students that we service, we see them every day. So if that child has a disp disposition unlike he had on or she had on yesterday, then I know that, so that something is wrong. So first, I'm gonna have a conversation with that child and allow that child to talk to me and I will speak to that child and then we are gonna address the concern. So I think that we need a more therapeutic approach to discipline instead of a punitive approach. And across the board, across the nation, there have been more punitive consequences handed down to black and brown students, which represent the mass majority of students within all these parish um, than our counterparts uh, white students. So that needs to be examined, not just here in New Orleans, but across the board. And we see it played out in New Orleans because it feeds into the school to prison pipeline. We see that New Orleans, um, we see that Louisiana has the highest amount of incarcerated persons in the country. That directly relates to education. That directly relates to how the child was disciplined within the school. So if we connect those dots, we can alleviate um, the school to prison pipeline. And also we could develop plans that service our students with empathy in mind, understanding their backgrounds, understanding their communities, and understanding the unique and particular specific circumstances that each child may face within their communities and their upbringing. Thank you, Mr. Witten. Um, Thank you. It is time for closing comments. You will have one minute each. Uh, but if you go over, I don't think anybody's going to nail anybody to the fence. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Park. Well, again, I you know thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak tonight. Uh, let me close by acknowledging what I am not. I am not a career politician. I'm not running for the school board so I can run for something else later. Uh, I am an educator uh, who believes and who's committed his life to helping children. And I've been very thankful and lucky to receive a lot of people who are on board with me in this campaign, uh, whether that is Congressman Cedric Richmond, U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu, State Senator Karen Carter-Peterson, or groups like Bold, IDEA, Coup, uh, Life, the Forum for Equality, and most importantly, the over 60 current or former teachers that have donated to my campaign already. Um, what I can promise is that I will be a board member who is totally immersed in and totally accessible to the community. And I can say that confidently because I have a history of immersing myself in school communities. I've been to the holiday programs at Esperanza. I've been to the dance recitals at Crocker. I've been to the days of service at Thurgood Marshall. Uh, to make sure that the, the walls are looking uh, fresh with a clean uh, with a new coat of paint. I'll be a board member who shows up when there aren't any cameras around, uh, who listens and takes to heart the concerns of students and families and teachers. I think communities deserve elected officials who listen to them and who advocate for them, and I intend to do both of those things. I am the only educator in the District 3 race. I am the only Democrat in the District 3 race. Uh, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today, and please follow Vote Olin on uh, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or go to olinparker.com to learn more. Thank you again, and have a great night. Thank you so much, Mr. Brickman. Yes, thank you again for the invitation, and thank you to my candidates for a good, uh, a good discussion here. Um, when I'm on the school board as your representative, I will be the independent voice for the children and parents and residents of District 3. I will not be satisfied with mediocrity or the status quo. And my decisions will be guided uh, by what's in the best interest of the children, first and foremost. I will also work to expand our choices by encouraging charters to open more uh, more campuses or take over failing campuses so we have better high quality schools for everybody across the city. And I will be, I will demand fiscal responsibility. We have a huge budget, a lot of resources going to our schools. Parents would probably be shocked to know that eight to $12,000 per child is being spent, but they don't have any good choices. Something's wrong there. Um, 
and I intend to take a look at it and get the resources where they need to go, which is the children. I'm number 125 on your ballot. I've been endorsed by Representative Stephanie Helferty and former city councilman and school board member Scott Shea. Please check out philbrickman.com for more information um, about my campaign, and I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Whitten, your final closing argument here. I stand to serve as the school board candidate that represents the entire community of Algiers, Marigny, and the French Quarter. I'm a native of Algiers. I'm a son of Algiers. I'm tied to the community for the community. I'm from the village for the village. I'm not a person that actually thought that I would actually run for any particular office in politics, but I saw a fundamental need for change in policy and true education in academic reform here in New Orleans. So I stand to represent the voice of the families of the students, the students themselves, the teachers, because I am an educator, and also the community as a whole to ensure that we're implementing policies and we have plans in place to best service those in our community. I will serve as that liaison between the community and the schools and the school board. I will serve as the community member that has always been present. I'm from Algiers. It's not like I'm not aware of the issues that we face. And I also, I'm out in the community every day participating and volunteering my time to better service our kids. I hold conversations with people within the community that revolves around conversation. I am the representative that can represent this district because I am the people, because the people are me. The people that I service within Orleans Parish District Number Four are people that I grew up with, the kids of the children that I grew up with, and also the children of the students that I've already serviced within District Number Four. So I stand to be that community person that will advocate for what's right for kids at all time and be a voice that has not been heard, the voice that has not been brought to the forefront of the conversation, a voice that has not been placed on the table of consideration in reference to creating formulating policies as it, as it revolves around educating our kids right here in New Orleans. So I'm Winston Boone Whitten Jr., number 131 on the ballot, Orleans Parish District number four. You can find more information at my website, everybodyvoteforboom.com. You can find me at everybody votes for boom, for boom, for boom on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram. I thank you for your opportunity. I ask for your support. I ask for your prayers. And again, I am the I am the candidate in District 4 that will represent the community, the students, the teachers, the families within the community so that they are best serviced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Brickman. And thank you, Mr. Witten. We really appreciate having you guys here. And best of luck on November 3rd. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Thank you so much. And thank you for the Thanks, urban guys. Have a good night. Mm -hmm. Is at this time we turn to District 5. And the candidates that join us for Orleans Parish School Board District 5, uh, Catherine Baldwin, is she with us? And also Ms. Priscilla Jackson. Uh, Ms. Baldwin, please tell me how to say your name because the one thing that I hate <laughs> is fumbling a person's name. Bodwin, you're doing real well. Bodwin, there we are. Yeah. <laughs> Priscilla Jackson, is that correct, Priscilla? That's correct, Grisella Alejandro Jackson, but you don't have to say the Alejandro because I know that may be a challenge. Jackson is fine. There you go. That's all good. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And if you've been with us since earlier, we spoke about a number of the items that were a part of the Urban League's report, the Orleans Parish uh, on, on education equity. Yeah. Of course. Uh, and, and we start into round one. Actually, let me step back for just a second. Uh, we actually don't start into round one. Yet our round one involves you guys giving us opening. And so we'll start with Ms. Bodwin and your opening statement. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Urban League for inviting us and for this really great topic of conversation and for um, extremely comprehensive and, and really um, 
wonderful report. It was very enlightening, and I, I hope everyone takes the opportunity to read it. Um, my name is Katie Bodwin. I'm running for the school board in District 5. Um, I am a public school parent. I'm a working mom, and I want to be a new leader for the New Orleans School Board. I'm excited to get into the topic this evening and, and have a good discussion and appreciate everyone's um, attention. Thank you so much. And Ms. Jackson, your, yes. open, your opening statement, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you tonight. I am Grisella Alejandro Jackson, a candidate for the District 5 OPSB seat. I am currently on the seat, having been appointed in June. And the first thing I want to do is thank the Urban League for this tremendous report because it, it is in your face with the data, the statistics, and the analysis that we need to better understand what is happening in our public schools. When I when I read this report, I started thinking about um, my own experience as a child coming from Puerto Rico at the age of eight. I knew no English. I was in the third grade and I was deathly afraid to answer any questions uh, on any work or test because I was afraid that I was going to put the wrong answer on the piece of paper. Because of my fear and anxiety and inability to speak the language, I was deemed slow and I knew I wasn't slow. I knew I was smart, but I had to repeat the third grade. And what my school at that time did not have and what the system did not have was educational equity. It did not have the access, it did not have the opportunity, and it did not have the accountability that it needed to be able to provide me with the services that I needed to have a better educational experience in the third grade. And this is what we have to strive to work to eliminate in our system, the inequalities that exist towards our economically disadvantaged students who are primarily black and brown. Just as we have differentiated funding for our special needs, uh, students with exceptionalities, so should we have differentiated funding for our economically disadvantaged students. Our students all start at a different place and it is our job to be able to provide the funding needed to be able to meet the needs of all of our students. So I thank uh, the Urban League for uh, this report. Uh, it's not that we didn't know that we weren't doing well, but it really puts the numbers and the analysis in your face and lets you look at this picture uh, in totality. Thank you so much, Ms. Jackson. And we will start right in and, and pretty much the second portion in our round one questions and the way that this works is that we will ask you one of these questions you will answer two it said two but maybe we'll do three since it's only two candidates tonight and you'll get a chance to answer uh, another one of the questions but essentially you'll get two minutes to answer i'll give you the setup we will start with miss jackson and speak to teacher quality the data shows that when it comes to the distribution of teachers rated highly effective, economically disadvantaged students and African-American students do not have equitable access. So the question is from one of the fellows of the Urban League's Policy Fellowship for Young Adults. Riley Smith is the fellow and currently attends Southern. She's an education major, currently student teaching, and she's getting closer to having the responsibility of managing a classroom. It's important to her that she had access to continued support and so one question would be how would you invest in the professional development of teachers as a school board member when i uh, was involved with restarting crocker uh, one of the challenges that we we had was of course hiring a staff and we were looking for highly qualified teachers we also were looking for certified teachers one of the big mistakes I think that the, the Department of Ed or the state made when they fired 
most of our veteran teachers is that they took a whole workforce from under us. So the workforce that we have today that we had back in 2006 when I started this charter work is inexperienced. Being able to uh, be trained in education, number one, to have certifications so that you have the training in classroom management that you need, number two, being able to provide the professional development, which is key to be able to grow teachers who know the subject matter, who know how to deliver instruction, who can uh, uh, know how to administer differentiated instruction, which means that you realize that all of your all of your children start in a, from a different place, but you have to be able to teach them the subject matter so that they can all come up together, no matter where they start. Professional development is key. We pour tons of money into professional development to make sure that all of our teachers were suited with what they needed to be able to bring our children through. And the teacher is everything in the classroom. I know when, when, when I was in school, I spent more time with my teachers than I did at home. So teacher preparation, teacher education, professional development, being able to pay our teachers what they deserve for the work that they do, being able to provide job security for our teachers so that they don't have to jump around from one school to the other. Uh, these are all important things that we as board members can support and aid uh, in different ways. Thank you so much, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Baldwin, uh, let's talk about school discipline and student discipline rates meaning in school and out of school suspensions and expulsions are lower in New Orleans and in the rest of the state. However, we look at disciplinary action by subgroups, of course, we find that economically disadvantaged students and African-American students are overrepresented. How would you support schools in addressing racial disparities in disciplinary action? I think you're muted. Okay, I think, and my internet cut out right as you were asking the question, but I think you were talking about um, discipline, right? Yeah, I can re repeat the question. That would be how, great. Thank you. How would you support schools in addressing racial disparities in disciplinary action? Great, thank you. And I, I thought that this was such an interesting part of um, of your of your of the report, the the Urban League's report, um, because it, I think it comes down. It starts with our teachers, right? We we need to have a teacher force that reflects um, our student population, um, because I think that we one of the most sort of compelling um, data points in this report was that um, teachers that are non that that white teachers um, have uh, you know are I'm sorry I'm getting myself mixed up but um, basically if you have a student body that is not that the demographics are not re are not reflected in the teacher population, um, you're going to have um, an unequal distribution of, of disciplinary action. And we have we know that black and brown students are um, subject to more disciplinary action than than non than white students are. And that is an inequity that we need to address at every level of the system. As I mentioned, I think it starts with a with us with a teacher population that reflects their student body. And that's something that is board members we can look to as we are um, authorizing and reauthorizing and checking in with our schools. What does their leadership look like? What you know? What is their what is the makeup of their board? What is their pup, what is their principal um, and and other school leaders? And what does their teacher core look like? And is it reflective of their student body? Are they aware of the issues that are going on in their students' lives? And how are they addressing them? before they get to a disciplinary action. Um, I also, you know, I, I, I am supportive of the centralized um, system of, of hearings um, at the school board to sort of um, ensure that we have, uh, that our policies are being, um, are, are being used uniformly um, and not disproportionately affecting um, our black and brown students. So. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Jackson, uh, let's let's tackle the selective admissions question. In the 2019 school year, some schools had eligibility requirements 
such as emerging language programs and required set levels of language proficiency and others that require parents or guardians to attend a curriculum meeting, open house or tour. The four public schools that do not participate in the one app application process and accept applications and make school assignment decisions based on the school level. The report looked at the demographics by admissions type and found that economically disadvantaged students and African-American students are underrepresented in schools with selective admissions and restrictive eligibility policies. So what are your views on selective admissions policies and what would you do to support changes to admissions policies if, if you're elected? Uh, intuitive, intuitively, just at my gut level, uh, the word selective means that you're keeping people out. <laughs> you're picking a few and keeping most people out, most students out. And we need to have a better approach as to how we educate all of our students. Uh, I can understand selective admission, but I don't understand inequitable admission. Uh, we need to be able to have written in these charter contracts per, proactively. See, a lot of times the board does, th does things reactively. We need to be proactive about what we want our schools to do and what we want our schools to become. And so in the initial contract, we need to make sure that we don't have this selective admission problem that we require these schools to take a greater number of black and brown students and that we make it as equitable as we can be for the entire population. We also need to make sure that all of our schools can be great schools, not just the selective admission schools. We need to have school leaders, tier one curriculum, teacher development, that way I can send my child to my neighborhood school and I don't have to worry about applying to a selective admission school because I know that what my child will get at my neighborhood school, which is a great school, is just as good as what the selective admission schools are preparing their children with. So we need to be able to broaden uh, the acceptance of black and brown children in selective admission schools. Ms. Baldwin, uh, eighth grade math, uh, concepts taught during eighth grade by the foundation, an understanding for future math concepts. Math prepares and develops the ability to accept, analyze, and execute complex ideas, and math performance is found to be a predictor of post-secondary success. Of course, in 2019, NOLA Public Schools reported 23% eighth graders scored mastery or above on the LEAP 2025 math assessment, which is below the state average of 28%. Additionally, the schools where more students score higher in eighth grade math have fewer students who are economically disadvantaged and more of the student population is white. So what would you want to see implemented to support schools in ensuring all students are reaching this critical milestone of eighth grade math? I think we need to start early. I think if we're focusing on eighth grade, um, it might be too late for some of our students. So I would like to see, um, I would like to see plans and curricula um, well before um, starting in, in you know early elementary and moving up through middle school. Um, I, I want to see where that schools understand that incredibly important milestone and that they have a plan to get their students where they need to be um, throughout throughout their education. Um, we, you know, this sort of high stakes at eighth grade is um, is not is not going to work for many of our students. So I want to see a clear plan from our schools. I want to know what curriculum they are using throughout the uh, throughout the, the the educational throughout the years, and I want to know why they've chosen that and how they think that it will get their students to where they need to be. I want to see that they are using it that that they are evaluating themselves throughout as well. So they're looking to see, um, here's our plan, here's how, we're, where, how our students are doing, and do we need to make adjustments? 
Um, I think we need to be supporting our teachers with continuing um, professional development throughout their career as well, so that they are um, they are staying up to date with all of the latest ideas and teaching methods and classroom management ma um, efforts. Um, I think we need to be building um, cohorts among our teachers, among our school leaders, so that they can share success stories and they can share some of their challenges. I think that there are a lot of common issues among our student, among our schools, and um, and they can they can really do a lot to help each other. So just in closing, I think we need to be starting early. We need to be focusing early. And as a school board member, I will be looking for data driven decision making at each of our schools so that they can really show why they're doing what they're doing and whether they're having success. And Ms. Bogan, while we've got you, we're going to circle back and we've got time because only two of you on the call mm -hmm. do not have uh, Ms. Antoinette Williams, but I'd like for you, Ms. Bogan, to address the issue of selective admissions. Okay. Sure. I mean, I think there's a there. I think there's there's room for some selective admission schools in our system. I think systems across the country have them, and and there's room for them. What I do not agree with is um, putting up barriers to entry um, just to get just to get in the door to see if you are um, if you if you can go to the school. Uh, when we were going through the one app process for our daughter um, three years ago. It was very clear that there are schools that are that make it difficult for working families to even apply to the school, um, and those kind of gatekeeping methods um, in a public school system, I think, don't do our our students any any justice. Um, and you know, we we need to be looking at that. Um, we I think there's room for schools that want to focus on arts um, or you know other other specific curricula. Um, my daughter goes to a French immersion school and I think it makes sense that after a certain year you have to have some language proficiency. What does not make sense is that you can't even get in the door to have um, that language proficiency um, determined. So that would be um, how I feel about selective admission. Thank you so much and Ms. Sure. Jackson we're going to have you touch base on school discipline question and I'd like to ask you uh, what role do you think the Orleans Parish School Board should play in that related issue you're sitting on the board now do you think you're achieving what you should be doing well uh, the first thing I think about when I think about um, discipline is uh, when uh, we ran Crocker we did not suspend or expel any student in our time operating that school because we were able to provide the social services the trauma-informed practices that our students and their families needed i think that we have to do uh, an inventory our schools need to make sure that they understand the biases that are inherent in all of us and to do an inventory and take an account of if I'm suspending black students uh, at, for for menial things at 10 times the rate that I'm suspending white students for the same things we've got a, a, a racism problem we've got a racial bias problem uh, we need to make sure that we can all we need to require from our schools, our faculties, our staff, our leaders, some racial sensitivity training, some bias training, because a lot of times we don't come from the same communities and we don't understand the needs of our community, the needs of the black and brown children's community. And we've got to make sure that we provide open, honest, transparent discipline for all of our children in the same way. So we need to implement some anti-bias training in our system, beginning with the board, beginning with the administration, beginning with the school leaders and the staff. I understand that 
the administration does centrally uh, look at the expulsions that go into play. And we need to be made aware of what those what that report says and how these schools came to the conclusion that someone needs to be expelled or suspended. We really have to be careful. The, the, the thing that I would like to emphasize is keeping our kids in school. If our kids are out, they're missing. If our, if our kids are being uh, uh, punished for menial things, that's unjust and it's also keeping our kids from learning. So I would like to emphasize some kind of program or some kind of policy that deals with keeping students in the school and providing the socio-emotional conflict resolution, trauma-informed practices that they need to resolve the problems that we have and be able to get an education. Thank you so much. Uh, you've survived round one ladies and thank you very very much <laughs> and we now move to round two it's only two questions and each of you will have a chance to respond to both of these questions we'll start with you miss bodwin uh we've asked you to respond to the data on important indicators related to racial equity in education but what issue is most important to you that you would prioritize if you were to be elected I'm sorry, if that was to me, my, my computer froze up, my internet froze up again, would you mind okay. repeating? Yes, I'll repeat the question. We've asked you to respond to the data on important indicators related to racial equity in the education. But yeah. what issue is most important to you that you would prioritize if you were elected? Thank you um, for repeating. I think um, what I, what I was most interested in and what I will focus on is, um, is the growth. Um, the, 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 the grade level, you know, of our schools is only one factor um, that we should be looking at when we're determining um, whether our schools are succeeding. Uh, we need to be looking at whether they're growing, whether their students are, um, are you know, their, their mastery of certain subjects are impro is improving from year to year. Um, and whether it's improving for all of their students, um, not for their economically disadvantaged students, for their, for, you know, across race, across um, gender demographics. Um, I think that's an important indicator. So I want to be, I will be looking at whether our schools are improving, whether they're working hard to get better. That goes for the D and F schools. It also goes for the A and B schools. Um, in my opinion, our schools need to be constantly improving. Um, when, uh, you know, when we were going and touring schools, looking for schools, you could tell the ones that were kind of sitting on their, resting on their laurels. Um, they felt pretty confident about their B grade. They knew that they were going to have parents wanting to attend them. Um, and so they felt like that was, they were doing enough as opposed to some of the schools we toured that were really trying to work hard to get those grades up. And you can tell, you can see it, and um, and that and, and feel it. And so, I would like to see schools constantly searching for that improvement. How can they get better? How can their students' um, outcomes get better? How can their school culture get better? All the things that we know improve outcomes um, for our for our for our students. So that's really what I'm going to be looking at as a member. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Ms. Baldwin. Uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, same question, we've asked you to respond to the data on important indicators related to racial equity in education, but what issue is most important that you would prioritize if you were, I guess, reelected to the seat? Well, um, I thought hard about this and <laughs> what really hit me the hardest was our children with exceptionalities, our special needs population. So, let's say you have a special need, you have an exceptionality, and that you're also a black and brown child. The, the administration has a motto. Every, every child, every day, every school, something to that effect. Every child, every school, every day. And we're not living up to that motto we're letting a lot of kids down. 
and a lot of families down, especially our children with exceptionalities, our special needs population. We need more funding. We need more specialized training. We need to be able to hone in to our special needs population and lift them up as we want to lift everybody up. They need greater access, greater opportunity, and greater funding to be made equitable and to be made whole and to have a chance. And uh, it, this is just something that really, you know, today I think there was, or uh, recently there was a, 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 something in the, uh, an article in, in NOLA.com about a school that had not even reported some of the special ed problems that they were having. Uh, we, <laughs> these kinds of things cannot afford to happen. We need to be able to take care of all our children. So this is an area that I would like to hone in on, should I be elected? All right, we will, and question number two, we'll start with Ms. Jackson. In reviewing the Urban League's recommendation, are there any that you strongly agree with and how would you actively support them? I agree with all of the recommendations. I think they're all solid and sound recommendations with regards to expanding our high achieving schools with regards to uh, collaborating and getting more support from the community. Um, but I think the one that struck me the most was the teacher training, uh, being able to grow a teacher force of highly effective teachers so that we have highly effective teachers at every school, not just at a select school. We need to be able to make sure that the teachers know their subject matter, that they receive the professional development, that they're certified and have a grasp on classroom management and to be able to give them the opportunity to grow because as you keep doing this work, if this is the work that you're chosen to do, that you're called to do, you can't help but get better because experience brings better results. Time will bring you better results. So, but we need to support our teachers as they're going through their formative years in the classroom to be able to be the pillars that they need to be for our students. Our students spend more time in front of their teachers than they do otherwise in their home or with their family or with their friends. The teachers, my teachers, the teachers I had in high school and junior high and elementary school, they may be gone and some of them are still here. Some of them I am still close to but they have left a lasting effect in my life. And their wisdom and instruction and the impact that they had on me guides me to this day. There is no one more important in that classroom to that student except that teacher. We need to be able to have the best teaching force that we can afford and that the kids need. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Bodwin, in reviewing the Urban League's recommendations, are there any that you strongly agree with and how would you actively support them? Um, same as Ms. Jackson, absolutely agree with all of them. Um, I thought it was a really well-researched and well-reasoned report um, with really clear and actionable um, recommendations, which I appreciate. Um, I think that the most the one that stuck out to me the most and one that I would like to work on is working to build a strong leadership pipeline. We have an awful lot of unelected school board members in this city and they need to be aware of their duties and responsibilities. They need to take the education of their students as seriously as we do as elected members of the school board. Um, and so I would like to work um, with, the, with the schools in District 5 um, I would like to meet with them regularly, the leaders regularly, um, just to just to check in, see how things are going, um, see how I can help connect with resources. I think being um, being being competitive, naturally competitive, as, as the schools are sort of set up to be, um, they maybe don't reach out to each other as much as they could. Um, we see that, you know, that has led to a lot of feelings of isolation among our principals, according to the New Schools for New Orleans report um, and our school leaders. So I would like to be that bridge. I would like to make those connections 
among our school leaders, um, help connect them with each other, should they be able to help um, overcome some bar some challenges, or with national best practices and experts. Um, I think we need to be building our teachers as up as well. Um, I think they, they are absolutely a natural fit for our future school leaders. Um, and so we need to be focusing on, um, as a school board member, I will be focusing on um, helping to build our teachers up as well. Um, so I think that that leadership pipeline uh, is, is really important to me and something that I'll work on uh, as a school board member. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now at question three of tonight's program, and it's about commitments. And your yes or no responses is all that we're asking. We will ask, will you commit to using the report regularly, the Urban League report that is, and to look at data that is disaggregated by the subgroups to inform your decisions if you are elected? Ms. Bodwin. Yes, absolutely. Ms. Jackson. Yes, no doubt, yes. And will you commit to prioritizing and practicing racial equity throughout your term as a school board member if you were elected? Ms. Jackson. Absolutely, yes. Ms. Bodwin. Yes, same. Time for our closing comments. And you guys are allowed uh, one minute each, but if you go a bit over, I don't think anyone uh, is going to lock you up or anything. And we'll start with Ms. Bodwin. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be with you um, this evening and to everyone watching. Um, this is an extremely important issue, um, equity in our education system. Um, and frankly, our the future of our school system is extremely important to New Orleans. I believe in public education. I'm a public school parent. Um, and I really believe that the future of our city de depends on a strong public school system. So I will work every day to ensure that all of our students have access to, to high quality education. Um, I am number 132 on the ballot. I am, my website, if you want to learn more about me and my platform is katiebodwin.com or you can find me on social media at votebodwin. Um, I am very fortunate and, and honored to have the endorsement of several groups and, and elected officials, but I want you to vote for me for me um, because I really believe in this and, um, and I, uh, this is my passion. So I appreciate the time tonight. I appreciate the report and um, hope everyone goes and gets a chance to read it. Thank you so much, Ms. Jackson. LB, it's been a pleasure being <laughs> with you tonight. I finally get to interact with you and not just look at you on the screen. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much for this opportunity and to the Urban League for this chance to come before you and uh, speak about uh, something that I am totally vested in. I have invested most of my life to this work. Uh, I am Grisella Alejandro Jackson, number 133 on the ballot, www.grisellajackson.com to my website. I am blessed to be able to do this work. I am a church girl married to uh, Pastor Robert Brian Jackson of the Historic Second Baptist Church. I'm the first lady there, the proud first lady. And I have worked with children and families directly one-on-one. -on -one beginning as a Sunday school teacher, as a vacation Bible school teacher, as a youth mentor, then developing a tutoring program where we tutored children from all over the city for free. You didn't have to be a member of the church. Developing an ACT prep program where we helped our juniors and seniors achieve higher ACT test scores and gained greater entrances into the admissions for the colleges and universities that they wanted to, to apply to. After Katrina stepping out into the neighborhood, we had a, a we were one block from Lawrence D. Crocker Elementary, being able to get a group of educators from my church and a group of uh, concerned and committed individuals from the community to come together to form a nonprofit, a nonprofit to organize a governing board, to write a charter application, to restart Lawrence D. Crocker Elementary and to bring back into that neighborhood the $23 million facility that is there today. 
I have spent the majority of my life working with children and helping them to provide greater, better quality public school educational opportunities. This has been my life. This is who I am. And this is why I do what I do. And this is why I am running. So uh, gracias para todos lo que, lo que hablan en español. Todavía lo hablo, lo leo. Y me comunico con ustedes también. Thank you to everybody, uh, to our Spanish-speaking population, to all of our citizens in New Orleans. I appreciate the opportunity, and I appreciate, and I'm thankful and humbled to have your vote. Thank you so much, Ms. Baldwin and Ms. Jackson. We really appreciate having you guys tonight. We really appreciate your passion and your knowledge of the issues as well. This is a three-night deal. Uh, last night, Will Sutton from over at the Times Picayune was in this seat, and we had a couple districts. And then tonight, we've had you guys along with District uh, Three and Four earlier. Tomorrow night, Districts Six and Seven with Oliver Thomas in this seat. We invite you guys to come back for that. But there are a couple of important reminders we'd like to put on your mind if you've tuned in with us tonight. And one would be to complete your 2020 census. We've gotten that grace until October 31st to take care of that. So it only takes about five minutes or so. If you haven't done it, you can do it online at uh, the census.gov website, the 2020census.gov website really quickly. Or if in fact the folks are knocking on your door, they're cool, answer it, knock it out in a couple of minutes. Also, registering to vote the deadline to register online is uh, October 13th. The mail-in registration deadline is over. That's the mail-in registration, not mail-in voting, but the mail-in registration and in-person is over. But you can register to vote online until the 13th. That is next week. Early voting is on October 26th through the uh, October 16th through 27th, I should say, 16th through 27th. There you go. Um, you can take care of that at any of the early voting spots around town. And of course, election day is on November 3rd. And yes, you can mail in your ballot this year. If you have COVID concerns or anything like that, you have to request that ballot and either mail it in or drop it off. But we appreciate you all being with us. Thank you guys so much for having me and best of luck to you both. Thank you. And best of luck to our city in this election. Good night, Thank you guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you.